All right. Well, good morning once again, everyone. I'm Leila Shahidel, Project Director of Wake Tech's Finish First and Seat Initiative. Finish First and Seat is a high impact, high volume, low resource, low cost solution for student success and completion. And we are delighted to bring you another partner support webinar today. The purpose of the partner support webinars is to provide technical support and helpful information to you as you're navigating the process of implementing the Finish First and Seat Seat. Now, in today's uh, webinar, in the first part, we'll be highlighting another Finish First and Seat partner college, Central Carolina Community College, to hear how they're using Finish First and Seat. And secondly, we'll host brief office hours to answer any questions that you might have about using the Finish First and Seat data tool. We always get really good questions from you um, in these sessions and hear valuable insights. So I want to encourage you once again to ask any questions that you might have without hesitation. It could be that someone else has the same question as you, so um, do feel free to ask your questions that you might have. Now that second part, the office hours is optional. So if you only want to remain for the college spotlight, you're welcome to excuse yourself after the end of the first segment. And of course, um, we'll have a space at, after or at the end of the first segment for questions, but if you have questions at any point, don't hesitate to put them in the chat box and we'll get to them as soon as we're able to. And of course, if you have any general questions or specific questions about Finish First and Seed that we can answer outside of this um, venue, definitely feel free to reach out to me by email. So before we get started, I wanna share just a few announcements with you. Um, in terms of our progress and dissemination, there are currently 48 colleges in the system that we've shared the Finish First and Seed data tool with. We recently shared the Finish First and Seed tool with Guilford Tech Community College, and I saw some folks from Guilford um, respond to this request. So thank you guys. I want to extend a warm welcome to our newest, newest college for being um, with us today. And there are a few more colleges scheduled to come on in the next couple of weeks, including McDowell Tech Community College and Western Piedmont Community College. And we hope to provide access to Finish First with the remaining community colleges by the end of the summer. We are at about the halfway point in the semester, so we want to remind you that now is an opportune time for you to run your Finish First and See Data tool for advising purposes. Running it now will let you capture students who will be within one semester of completion at the end of the semester, so you can see which programs or program, uh, program or programs these students will be able to complete very soon. Uh, and be sure to update your transcript and former report to pull transcripts for students who were active this semester um, and pull an updated graduation file to include students who completed credentials last semester in the fall 2020 semester. As far as exclusions go, if your registration has not yet started, when prompted, you'll enter zero semesters, zero exclusions. And if your registration has started when prompted, you'll either enter one or two, depending on if it's just your summer registration, that would be that one, or if it's both your summer and fall registration, in, in that case, that would be those two. And the near completion output file would show students who are close to completion and the courses that they have remaining to take. You can then use that as an advising tool to make sure that those students enroll in the courses during your registration period. Um, and you can also run it on previously enrolled students if you want to encourage them to re-enroll in the courses that they need in the upcoming semesters. Now that's for students close to completion. And if you have not yet captured students who have unclaimed completed credentials, you can also run Finish First Now to capture those students, assuming your fall 2020 grades have been finalized. Um, and again, uh, you'll want to update your transcript and former report to pull transcripts for students who were active last semester in the fall 2020 semester and pull an updated graduation file to include students who did graduate, I should say exclude students who did graduate last semester. And for exclusions when prompted, if your registration has not yet started, exclude one semester, that would be the current semester, spring 2021. If your registration has started when prompted, you'll either enter two or three semesters, that would be spring 20, 2021 and summer, if summer started, and then also fall 2021, if fall registration has been on two. And then in that case, the new completion output file would show you students who have fulfilled requirements to complete credentials but have not received them by the end of the fall 2020 semester. As I mentioned in our last webinar, we are working on updating all colleges to version 3.0. And I wanna clarify again a question that we got about version 2.5. So if you are a college that is using version 2.0, when we update you, it will be an update to version 3.0. 
Um, when we did version 2.0, that added a few minor features, but substantively versions 2.0 and 2.5 are really, they're just about the same version, but version 3.0 adds quite a few more enhancements, which is why when um, we update all colleges, all colleges will receive the update to version 3.0. In general though, you can expect to receive an update of your Finish First NC program at or close to the date of either your initial site visit or a year from your most recent um, update, your most recent Finish First update that you received from us. Since we have expanded to almost 50 colleges now, we wanna make sure that all colleges have an opportunity to access their tool at any given point of the year, especially if it will be expiring. So maintaining that schedule for updates will help us ensure that all colleges have access to their tool at any given time. Now, some major updates for the version 3.0 include integration of student contact information and integration of data collection, which will facilitate the process of reporting data. Um, and there are a few colleges that have received updates uh, from us. So I wanna encourage those schools to set up a time with us to go through your test run as soon as you can, so you can take advantage of those enhancements, including the data uh, collection integration. And speaking of the data collection, thank you to those who have sent in your semester data already to us. In our last webinar earlier this month, we reviewed the requested information for you to send to us. Our data analyst, Jennifer Nicholson, has emailed the forms to all the colleges, and we wanna capture in that information data for your students who were active in the fall 2020 semester. So please send us your completed forms no later than April 16th. And if you have any questions as you're completing that, please let us know. Um, also, I want to just remind everyone that we have engaged the Belk Center at North Carolina State University to conduct an independent study of the impact of and best implementation practices for Finish First NC. Um, and lastly, uh, or I guess I have a few more, so maybe not lastly, but we also just want to remind everyone that we have a video that covers how to run Finish First NC. It does cover version 2.0, so that could also be used by version 2.5 users. And we are in the process of creating a video and other support materials for version 3.0 um, as well. Now I will post a video of uh, the link to the video rather in the chat box in just a moment. And in the last couple of webinars, I've forgotten to do this. So uh, my apologies to anyone who was waiting on that link. And if I forget this time, Jennifer has promised to give me a nudge. So I will post it <laughs> in the chat box for you. Now in today's webinar, you'll have the opportunity to hear how stakeholders at Central Carolina are using Finish First and C. If you and your colleagues are interested in sharing how you're using Finish First at your uh, college, please contact me to let me know. All right, at this point, I'm going to yield the floor quickly to Kai, who will share a few announcements with us too. Kai? I'm off? Yes, you're on. Sorry, I was answering another uh, uh, phone call from 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 somebody else. OK, so. Um, there, there are a couple of things uh, that we hear back from from you all regarding, you know, some of the uh, substitutions and some of the program substitutions of that. So I want to clarify some of the uh, uh, conversation so you all we're all on the same page. Uh, we have, so let me begin from the beginning, uh, start from the beginning. So when we receive the output file that you run with XUPR, those include all the programs you have and the program requirements. So we build our database based on those output files that we got from you. So for example, let me take as the associate art degree requirement. For example, the art within AA degrees, you have a math requirement that has three courses based on the uh, system wide uh, requirement that include math 143, math 152 and math 171. If my memory is it's correct. And some of the schools would be able to use uh, other classes for the course substitution. However, if that is not included in the program requirement that you sent to us, the tool would never know. And we would never know that you can use, for example, Math 172 to substitute for Math 171, for example. 
So in order for you to be able to have that include in your program study, we would need that information to be sent from you so that we can build that into your program requirements. If that is not part, uh, that is not include your XUPR in, uh, output file, we would never know. And, and when you uh, look at the output, you will see, oh, this student has math 140 or math 145, but in your local system, you may have specified that as a, as a, a substitute courses. But because of the output file that we receive from you doesn't include that. So the tool would never know and we would never know. And and that will be not automatically included in your evaluation. So what I'm saying is in order for the tool to include that, you have to let us know in advance before we send the tool to you. So that's one. And two is um, the great scheme file when we send it back to you and we ask you to confirm the what grades should be included, what should be excluded. That is extremely important because all the GPA calculations and the institutional credit hours calculation are based on that. If that information uh, you didn't, you know, was wrong, then you would miss some of the, you know, the completers or the um, the near completers. So that's important. We would like you to confirm that. And the third one is the program list. So basically, when we build your program requirement database, we based on the information from the XUPR output files that you sent us to us. Any of the programs that, that include in those XUPR output, we would include that in the database we build and we sent to you. So for example, if you have programs have exactly the same requirements, but under different names, we wouldn't know. So therefore the tool wouldn't know. For example, you have uh, the early college uh, uh, students program. For example, you have a 10100 EC, you will have a 10100. And those two pretty much having the same exactly the requirement. If we catch that, we would normally exclude the A100EC from your program requirements. And all your students will be evaluated against A10100. However, locally, if you award A10100EC to the early college students, we wouldn't know. So at WEC Tech, we award only A10100 to the early college students even. So, and we don't award the A10100 uh, EC. The impact of that is that if we evaluate every student against A10100, then we compare that with your prior graduation requirements. So if you had award students A10100 EC, then the code would not know. So you will have some of the early college students identified as completing a 100, I got, I said too many times of that. I, I, I would not know what I'm talking about. So what happened is your early college student, if you, they have been awarded a 10100 EC, then the code will still identify of them of them as completed A10100. So you would think the code will be smart, smart enough to tell that they're the same. As a matter of fact, the code, it's not that smart. It can't tell the difference and unless you tell the code to tell that difference. So what I'm saying is you will have some of the students are identified as completed some of the code, but you have a different code name in your system that that it's exactly the same. So that's one example. Another example you probably have run into this is the system office. The system wide has an IT realignment program. So previously, all the IT programs have their 
a special code. Now they're all lumped into A25590, I believe that's it. So you can you may have identified a student who completed some of the A255. Uh, then you have other, you know, the postfix along with it. And that's another issue. So in order to take care of that, automatically for us, we haven't built that. We need to have a crosswalk. So when we do the prior graduation evaluation, we can include that information, but because we haven't asked that crosswalk from any of our sister colleges, you would run into that same situation too. So how do we do that? If everybody wants to the code to take care of that, then we would have to ask the crosswalk from every individual schools and every individual school will have a different crosswalk so we can take care of that automatically. Uh, but we haven't built in that into the code, so we would recommend you to take care of that locally. You build your crosswalk, then I can show you how to use Excel to exclude those. So what I'm saying that that's going to be individual school dependent. So now the code doesn't take care of that because it doesn't know that. I hope I make myself clear on that. Um, the fourth one is the cost splitting. There are lots of schools that split the courses for some of them have a, 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 a you know huge uh, contact hours. For example, cosmetology, some of them have eight, nine contact hours. You split that locally, but if they were not included in your XPR, XUPR output, and That's the code wouldn't know, yeah, we wouldn't that's what know. We use to um, help students determine, you know, how close they are to uh, finish. Okay. okay. Thank you, Kai. And, and if I could ask everyone who is um, uh, not presenting to please mute your microphone. Uh, to make sure that everyone else can hear. I'll just type that in the chat box too. Okay, I think we got a mute. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so if, if you have questions about that, I'm going to ask you to stick around. I, I do want to. I wanted to make sure that everyone had the chance to hear that since it does apply to all colleges. You might have questions about that, um, but at this time I do want to make sure that we have enough time for Central Carolina to also present and we'll um, allow you a space to ask any questions about what Kai mentioned or anything else that you might have questions about. Um, you can put that in the chat box or stick around for um, after uh, the, the uh, spotlight segment to make sure that we can get your questions answered. All right, so thank you for sharing that Kai. All right, and after the webinar is over, I will share a brief survey to gather your feedback on the webinar. So please complete that when you receive it. We do read your feedback. Um, you take the time to share it, so we take the time to read it. So um, when you get that link, please do take a few moments if you're able to to complete that survey. Um, and finally, uh, we will we are recording this uh, webinar. So barring no technical difficulties, I'll share the link of the recording to everyone as well. Uh, we won't record any of the question and answer segment to make sure that people are comfortable asking their questions without thinking about the recording. Um, but the first part, the college spotlight will be recorded, so I'll share that with you. All right, so thank you for um, all of these announcements. And at this point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And we're going to hear from Central Carolina. We are delighted to present another spotlight to you, highlighting Central Carolina Community College in Sanford, North Carolina. Um, Central Carolina was one of the first colleges to adopt Finish First and See, so I'm really excited to hear the information that they'll share with us about how they're working with it. We're joined today by Stormy Massatelli, who is Director of Institutional Effectiveness and Research at Central Carolina, and Christy Copes, who is Institutional Research Analyst there. Um, if you have any questions for them or for us along the way, go ahead and throw those in the chat box and we'll get to them as soon as we're in, as soon as we're able to. And once Stormy and Christy are finished, I'll come back on to transition us over to the office hours. So with that, Christy and Stormy, I hand it over to you. Thank you. Let me just share my screen real quick. All right, can everyone see? Yes. Okay, great. 
Well, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. We are excited to talk about Finish First at Central Carolina Community College, um, give you an idea of how we use it um, and why we do love it so much. As Layla mentioned, we were early adopters. We were very excited. We heard Kai um, talk about it and give a presentation. Um, and I think I might have emailed him while he was still talking. I was so excited. So. Um, Needless to say, we are big fans um, and we're happy to share any information we can. My name is Stormy Massatelli. I'm the Director of Institutional Effectiveness and in Research, and I also have Christy Copes, our Institutional Research Analyst. And I do think that I saw Dr. Linda Scaletti in on the call. So Linda, if you ever want to jump in, feel free to jump in and give your perspective as well. I'll just go over quickly the agenda of what we intend to talk about today. First, we're going to give you a college overview so you can get an idea of Central Carolina Community College, what our demographics look like, may help you understand some of our processes a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk about Finish First at Central Carolina and how we use it, what purposes. We'll talk a little bit about our workflow um, for each of the ways that we use it and feel free to interrupt and ask questions during that segment. I know that is um, a big point of interest for a lot of people. We're going to talk about the impacts that it's had on Central Carolina. We've had a lot of them, so we're excited to share that. And then my favorite part, lessons learned and best practices. So this is where we can kind of talk through um, what we have modified in our processes and things that might be useful to you to take back to your institution. Um, and we'd also love to hear from you. So if you have tidbits of information, please share. And then we will wrap it up at the end with some discussion and questions. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Christy to give an overview of CCCC and our demographics. Thank you, Stormy. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to start us off today by sharing a little bit about Central Carolina Community College. We have a three county service area with main campuses in each of our counties. Those counties are Chatham, Harnett and Lee. We also have over 20 satellite locations scattered across three counties, including high schools and early colleges, as well as health science centers in Chatham and Harney counties. To tell you about our student population, we thought we would use one of our dashboards. What you're gonna be seeing here is our 2021 spring enrollment dashboard. As you can see, we have almost 5,000 students enrolled this spring including around 2,100 dual enrolled students. Nearly 30% of our students are Lee County residents, followed closely by Harnett County, which is home to about 27% of our students. Chatham County students make up 23% of our population and the remainder of our students come from surrounding counties. Our students mainly fall into three main categories when looking at race, ethnicity, white, Hispanic, and black, with white students comprising more than half of our student population. The majority of our students are part-time, as you can see when you look at the average number of credits being taken, which is currently just over eight. And our two largest uh, programs are College Transfer Pathways and College Transfer Associates Degrees. And we'll go back to the slides for a little background on the use of Finish First at CCCC. We began using Finish First in the fall of 2018 with our first real run being in spring of 2019. There are several ways that we use the program. The first being to identify new completers and near completers. Since the spring of 2019, we have awarded over 800 credentials to students who were identified by the Finish First program as new completers. We have also awarded 642 credentials to students who are identified as near completers in the 2019-20 academic year. While many of these students may have applied to graduate on them, their own, some of them would not have been aware of their near graduation without using the Finish First tool. The next way we use Finish First is to identify completers who have stopped out. In our first run in the spring of 2019, for stop out students, we looked back at students who had not been enrolled in the past two years and were able to award 170 credentials. 
going forward, we look at students who have not been enrolled for two consecutive semesters to see if they've earned a credential or if they are close to completing a credential. We also use Finish First as a retention tool to provide motivation for near completers to continue their studies in order to earn their credential. Advisors are able to use the Finish First data to advise those near completers and remind them how close they are to completion. Advisors are also able to use the list of possible completers to help ensure that students make it to graduation day. Finally, we use Finish First for recruitment. By looking at near completers who haven't been enrolled for two consecutive semesters, our recruiting staff has a tool they can use to talk to students and encourage them to come back and finish their credential. Now I'll turn it back over to Stormy for more information on our Finish First workflow. All right, so the first part of our workflow I'm going to talk about is the timeline. So the first task when we got this was to get a group together to talk through the timeline and how this tool could be best used. So that initial meeting included vice presidents, deans, the registrar, and our recruitment area. And so the goal of this group was to um, talk about what a timeline would look like and how it would best fit into our current processes or what might need to change. Um, and also, how could we use this tool to have the biggest impact on student success and student completion? So the timeline that we came up with um, is very similar for the different groups, but we typically look at these as three chunks um, of students when we're using the tool. We look at students who are no longer enrolled. Um, we run these typically in the main terms. So we run this in the fall and in the spring, but not in the summer. Then we have our currently enrolled students who are potential graduates, and then our currently enrolled students who are near graduation. So as you can see, we keep our timeline pretty consistent. Um, we run it in February, June, and September. Now these are our um, times that we, we plan and absolutely run this tool, but we have found that you can use the Finish First tool all throughout the semester for various purposes, and it is incredibly useful. Um, Anytime that a, a department or dean is looking for a specific piece of information, we have found countless times where this tool has aided us in providing more information to those people. So um, don't think that you can only run it one time. We run it numerous times with um, different categories of students for different purposes. So this is our general workflow. Um, it is a, a little bit different based on what population of students that we're looking at. But for all of them, the first piece that we do is obviously run the required informer reports for the program. We run the finish first tool and then we run some supplemental um, informer reports. So this um, as the versions have changed, we have had to run fewer and fewer supplemental informer reports. So yay, thank you so much. Um, it has taken the burden off of that a little bit, but we do still add things. Um, to make it easier for the end user. So we run an informer report so that we can add the advisor. We also run a report to add things like holds, um, and we also use it to pare down our report. So we, um, or our lists, we run it um, and we identify students who have already earned an equal or higher credential, and we remove those from our lists. Now that's an internal process that may not be something that you want to do at your institution, but that is a piece that we do um, at our institution. The next step is to share it with the registrar and the Dean of Advising. So we have found for us the best way to do this um, instead of it getting lost in email is we have created an FFNC Google Drive and the registrar and the Dean of Advising have access to that. So we upload all of our lists there. Um, into various folders and uh, obviously named as clearly as we possibly can. Um, and this has worked really great because everyone has access to it. They can see it. They can add notes if they want. Um, and any notes that people add helps us when we run the tool again the next time. Our third step is to actually make contact. So make contact with the advisor or make contact with the student. Um, the advisor will receive two separate communications. So the advisor is going to receive communication as it pertains to students who are currently enrolled. So they will get two emails typically. Um, well, I'll say currently 
Um, right now they get one email for students who are identified as potential graduates and they will get just their list of students um, that way that they can review it. Um, they can reach out to the student and they can do all of this prior to the graduation application deadline. The second email is the list of students who are near completion, um, hopefully within one term, and this is sent to them prior to the advising and registration session happening. That way, again, they have the time to review the list and reach out to students before that happens. The next is contact made with students. And this is only for potential graduates. So currently this semester we sent out an Aviso task to our students. So what that is, I'll show you an example of it in a couple of minutes, but they are assigned tasks. So it'll say um, have a discussion with your advisor pertaining to potential graduation or something to that effect. So this is just kind of another catch. If for some reason the advisor did not reach out to a student that is a potential graduate, then that student also gets the little poke. So it's another way that we can make sure the student and the advisor connect and can get to that graduation application before the deadline. Then for not enrolled students, if we have students who are no longer enrolled and identified as potential graduates, the registrar's office will first review the information, make sure they truly are completers, and then they will send out a letter to the student. Now we have chosen in our process to make this an opt out letter. So it will say something like, hey, Christy, congratulations, you have completed your Associate of Arts. If for some reason you would prefer not to be awarded this credential, please contact our office and they've, they're given a deadline. If they do not contact the registrar's office, then they will be automatically graduated. If students are not currently enrolled and are close to graduation, this has been a really wonderful tool for our recruitment area. They can use this to call students, uh, to text students, mail something to students, however it is that they wanna reach out and say, hey, you are so close to completing. Congratulations, we're excited for you. Please come back. Um, here's when advising is, here's when registration is. What can we do to help you finish this credential? So it's just another tool that they can use to motivate students to continue on. Step four is something that is always really important in our office um, and obviously helpful with for FFNC in general, but we try to close the loop. So we will track student graduation applications. So once that list has gone out to advisors, we will continue to track it against the number of students who have um, applied for graduation. That way we can continue to prompt advisors or students before that graduation application is due. At the end of the term, we will look at graduates and see how many of the students identified were actually graduated uh, for both enrolled and not enrolled. And then for students who were near completion, we will track registrations for upcoming terms. Um, so that again, we can continue to, to utilize that list and see how impactful it's been. And then of course, um, make any changes that we would like to make for the upcoming term and the next time that we run the program. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and hand this over to Christy to talk about some of the major impacts that we've had. Um, and I will say we've had some wonderful outcomes from this. Yes, we have had several noted impacts from our use of Finish First. Um, the most noted impact has been credentials awarded to stop out students. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that first run that we did in the 2019 spring semester, looking back at students who had not been enrolled for the past two years, we awarded 170 credentials and taking that group and looking through the spring of 2020, we awarded over 250 credentials. This includes students who had completed a credential and students who were within one semester of completion and returned to complete their program. Finish First has also contributed to our increasing graduation rates. Over the past four years, both our 150% and 200% graduation rates have risen by 10% or more, which is something we've been very excited about. Finish First has also been a powerful tool for advisors to use in motivating students who are close to graduating to stay the course and finish the credential. 
It can also give students who are no longer enrolled the motivation to return to school, take the remaining courses and earn their credential once they realize how close they really are. Another impact we've seen has been appreciation from our advisors who have used Finish First as additional resource when advising and motivating students. It serves as an additional check for them in getting their near completers registered for all the courses they need to graduate in the upcoming semester and in making sure that new completers have registered for graduation. Lastly, using Finish First is prompting the creation of a new policy at our school that we hope to see put into place very soon. We currently have a practice in place for awarding credentials once a student is no longer enrolled at the college, but we need to create an actual policy so that this practice continues in the event of staffing changes. Stormy is now going to touch on some lessons learned and best practices. Okay, lessons learned. This is one of my favorite pieces, as I mentioned before, because these are some of the things that hopefully you can bring back to your institution. Um, and please chime in if you have things that you could share with us as, as well. Um, one of the biggest things that we have learned is that wording matters. Um, and this goes for wording to advisors and wording to students. Um, Test out your wording for any of your emails or communications with a group of students ahead of time to make sure that you you really are as clear as you think you're being um, and then do the same thing with advisors. This can can definitely send um, save you a headache later on. So an example of this is in the fall semester, we sent in a visa message with tasks to students who were potential completers. Um, what we learned from that message is that we were not as clear as we thought we were because um, the Dean of Advising was inundated with phone calls from both students and advisors who were who were confused. Um, an example would be um, Christy, I keep using you, I'm sorry, but for example, if Christy was um, enrolled in the Associative Business Program and she received something that said, hey, congratulations, it looks like you're completing your credential. That's not exactly specific or clear, um, and she may think, oh, wow, I thought I had another semester or two before I was done. Cool, I'm done with my associate degree, um, when in reality she was completing a certificate. Um, or, for example, FFNC, it looks at um, a student's courses that they've taken, and it identifies any credential that they may have completed, regardless of whether they are active in that program. So that can be really confusing to students. So say that it just so happened Christy finished the courses for a certificate in accounting. Well, that's really confusing. She might think, well, that's weird. This must be a mistake because I'm not in accounting. So my point being, test out your wording. Um, make sure that it makes sense. Make sure that it is specific. The next one is timing is very important, and I think we have um, kind of figured out our timing now, but all of our processes have changed just a little bit every time that we run this process. And there was one year where we were a little late in running the Finish First tool, and it was after graduation applications were due. So this can be a snowball effect. As you can imagine, we ran this after the fact, and then the registrar's office was bombarded with late graduation applications. So make sure that you're aware of different timing and processes at your institution if you have graduation applications, find out what those that date is. Um, find out when advising begins. Find out when registration begins. Um, try to get an idea of the busiest times for the departments that are going to need to use this the most so that you can pinpoint that sweet spot for using the tool. Next one is stackable credentials. Um, these can be confusing, similar to the example I used before um, for, for both students and advisors. Um, at one point, we had some communication to from advisors saying that they thought and students thought that if they were awarded a certificate after that, they had to reapply to the college and reapply to get into the diploma or associate program. So uh, provide training on processes and stackable credentials and make sure you are aware and anyone using this tool is aware of um, stackable credentials if you have them and what that looks like at your institution. Here is an example of what our Aviso task looks like. So as you can see, um, a student is going to receive a little message. Congratulations, it appears you're eligible to graduate. 
please complete the following steps and then they have different steps. Um, I did cut off on the, the picture here. There is a column where it shows who the task is assigned to. So you can see that first task, contact your advisor for graduation discussion. Next one is advisor reviews graduation application. And so obviously that one is assigned to the advisor. And then submit your graduation application. Some of the best practices that we have found and things that have worked really well for us, um, I've mentioned this, but again, overall thinking through the details, the processes, the timelines, the people involved, the more that you, you do the planning up front, the less um, struggles or, or issues you'll have down the line with it. So um, making a plan early and then off, obviously being flexible as you go and being willing to change things after the fact um, to get the best use out of the tool. Communication, meet with all parties impacted and involved, to create a plan together. This produces not only great ideas, but it also gets people really excited for the potential impact that this can have on our student success and on our student completion. Um, and it also helps just make sure everyone is on the same page, so it's not a surprise when something pops up in their email or they get a phone call from a student. Also make sure that your advisor and registrar are reviewing the output. Um, there are little nuances that you might have at your institution. As Kai mentioned earlier, substitutions are a big one. Um, this is great because a, an advisor can look at their list of students that are within one term and say, for example, they've got a math course in their column that says unused courses, and it says that they're still missing their math requirement. Maybe it is that math 172 and you know that that can be substituted. Well, just like that, you have been able to move that student from your potential graduate or your near graduate list over to your potential graduate list and you can call them and get them ready for graduation doing the graduation application. Also looking at things like a D uh, for transfer degrees, um, just double checking that those are not being used in the in the calculation. Um, other things like internal requirements that you may have. For example, this was uh, really helpful for us because we found that our data tell listing for our associate didn't specify that we have a lit course as a requirement for our humanities. That is an internal requirement, but it wouldn't, wasn't in the program. So we were actually able to pick that up because we did have our advisor and registrar reviewing it. Run it early. Um, one of those things I keep talking about early, early, early. Um, make sure your timing is on point. This will give you time to correct any issues. It will give you time to spot check your lists and obviously it will allow your advisors to review their lists prior to any of those deadlines, graduation applications, registration, etc. And then make it easy. Um, if you take anything away from this presentation, take this away. The easier you make it for people to use the output, the more likely that they are to use it. Um, and then, of course, the more likely we are to see our student success rate increase and our student completion rate increase. So, for example, um, early on, we used to send out to advisors the output in an Excel spreadsheet, but it was the entire Excel spreadsheet. And then we said, hey, go through this list and look for your advisees. Well, advisors are busy. Um, they're also, you know, faculty members. So that was not as successful as we are now. So what we do now is we say, hey, here's a list of your advisees that are potential completers or are within one term. And so they we have gotten a lot of feedback on that small, simple change that didn't take us a, necessarily too much time to make has had a huge impact on how much they are able to use the output of the tool. So here's just a quick um, example. Obviously, you tailor your your emails to your advisors or communications to your advisors, however it works for you. But we, what we have done is we've identified only their students and then we have outlined exactly the steps that we are hoping that they will follow. The information we provide to them is, is pretty much what comes out um, of the Finish First tool. As I mentioned earlier, we used to add in some of that contact information, but in the newest version, it is already there for us, so that is fantastic. Um, and then we, of course, also have decided to take out students who have already earned an equal or higher credential. So 
So quick recap, um, if you take anything away, we love Finish First. We were one of the early adopters and we have been using it ever since and have absolutely loved it. Um, it's making a difference one student at a time and we look forward to continuing to use it, continuing to help our students succeed um, and use this tool in the future. So that is it for us and we are happy to answer any questions that you have um, or just kind of talk about it a little bit with you. All right, is there anything in the chat box? No, nope. not okay. anything in the chat box. Um, can you share Stormy and Christy about how long it took from the time that you guys had the tool to when you were really up and running with it? So uh, I don't remember the exact month that Kai and Brian came out, um, but I know that we did get it in the fall and we used it internally, kind of playing around with it, trying to figure out exactly how it worked in the fall, but we didn't start using it um, as a college process until the spring, but I'd say that that's fairly quickly to you know get it in the fall, play around with it, and then fully implement it in the spring. So um, it it's been great. Um, anytime we've had any question, you guys have been wonderful about helping us work through it. So I would say very quickly. And then, what were some of the things that you did to garner support and buy-in from your stakeholders at Central Carolina so that? they could understand better, you know, what this tool is, how it was going to help you. What were some of the things that you shared or did with them? Well, I think we were fairly strategic in who we invited to Kai's presentation. Um, so that that kind of started it off really well. And then also being strategic in getting that initial group together um, and making sure that they could really see the impact and how it could be used and really showing how much time it could save them and how the impact it can have on student completion. So I think making sure you have the right people in the room in the planning process um, will really create a lot of buy-in. Any questions for Stormy and Christy at the moment? Well, thank you so much for sharing Stormy and Christy. Um, if anyone has questions for them, they will stick around until the very end. We're kind of nearing the end of the hour now, um, but you can feel free to drop them in the chat box. Um, so what I'll do now is I'll stop recording and we can transition into our open uh, question and answer segment. So give me just a moment to stop the recording. <laughs>